I think it's worth starting this video by explaining that a lot of games you would have played during your childhood I've probably never even heard of. At the time of the Nintendo Wii, while it was a game console that I would use a lot, it was mainly for the odd game like Pikmin 2 or Smash Bros. Brawl. There was a lot of games I didn't actually play until recently, for example Super Mario Galaxy. I've only just picked them up about a month ago. However, there was a game that my friend suggested two years ago, and while it did take me a while to get around to it, I finally picked up a game called No More Heroes. And you know what? It was very surprising how good this game actually was. So today, I thought I'd talk about it. So let's have a little look into a game called No More Heroes for the Nintendo Wii. No More Heroes is a Wii exclusive that released back in March of 2008 in the EU, with the earliest being the launch in 2007 for Japan. It was a Wii exclusive at first with a port to the PlayStation and Xbox in 2010, but uh, yeah, we'll stick with the Wii version for now. No More Heroes sets you in the shoes of Travis Touchdown, a nobody who's on a drunken attempt of wooing a woman, and he ends up taking a job as a hitman with his first target being another assassin. Upon killing him, Travis then learns that he's now ranked 11 as the best assassin in some Assassin's Association. With very little going on for Travis at the time, he then decides that he wants to fill his ego and become the best of the best by being ranked number one. So after Travis explains that in a little cutscene, you start off heading to the 10th assassin's location from where you hunt him down and kill him like the rest of the assassins in the game. The first level is set in this swanky mansion and you get a little tutorial at the start. Normally I'd just skip over these but with these being Wii games, I'm more than likely going to have some kind of Wii gimmick or Wii motion control gimmick. As commonly with the Wii titles, the gimmick is just to be shoehorned in. But surprisingly the controls for this game are pretty basic. Hold Z to lock and block, press A to attack, and B to stun and also grab. It's a pretty standard hack and slash control set, and I think it works fine for this game. One thing to know about the combat in this game though, instead of it just being an infinite hack and slash, your saber actually has a charge meter. So once it's been depleted from either blocking or hitting too much, you'll have to hit one on the Wiimote and initiate the charge mode. And this is where the motion controls start to appear. As to charge the saber, yeah, you need to do that. The motion controls don't end there though, once you grab someone you get a QT where you have to swing both the Wiimote and Nunchuck in a certain direction to throw them to the floor. At first they're the same, just going in one way or the other, but after a while they do start changing the directions to try and keep you on your feet, but you'll also get another simple QT at the time when you kill the enemy as well. Once you've depleted their health, similar to when they're stunned and grabbed, you'll just have a motion to swing either left or right, but this is pretty simple, so it's not too bad. For the motion controls in this game, I can live with it, it doesn't expect me to get off my ass and dance with the Queen and Country, but I've noticed half the time it would even pick up the motion properly, so I'll just swing the way it wants me to swing and then I'll be waiting for Travis to actually continue, but I'll get no response from him, I'll lose my grip and then just get the shit kicked out of me. It's irritating to say the least, but it's overshadowed by the more problematic issue. To add an extra layer to the combat, you can hold your saber high or low, depending on the stance of the enemy, you'll need to swap between the two to actually make a hit, otherwise they'll just keep blocking it as expected. I quite like this feature as an idea, it's a nice way to add a little bit of depth to an otherwise basic hack and slash. As for achieving these stances, to get a high stance you have to tilt the Wiimote up while obviously a low stance would be tilting the Wiimote down. And you'd think that's simple enough right? Well it should be but the game finds this overly sensitive, as you can see from Travis having a little fit over there. It might be I just hold my Wiimote like an elderly person and my hand is shaking the entire time, but a simple flick of the d-pad while holding down another button would be a fine alternative. So once you're done with this tutorial, you're free to progress with the main game. The first level sees you progressing through the mansion, clearing out rooms of enemies, and then similar to a game like Devil May Cry, the next level will be blocked off until you kill them all. So you go through a couple of rooms, beating the everlasting hell out of some people, with some random occurrences of power-ups which will vary in style, but always guarantee an easy kill. These special abilities do have some variation, one is just like a speed up of your attacks, another is a ranged attack, and another, you just walk up to them and hit a button. But if you don't hit the right button, Travis just taunts like a twat. But you don't really see these much in the game anyway, so I don't mind too much and they don't last forever. Once you've gone through destroying everybody in all these rooms, you'll eventually get a phone call from a girl called Sylvia Crystal, who Travis speaks to at the start of the game. She calls to explain what you're about to face while also going out of her way to insult you. I genuinely find this kind of annoying because not only does Travis start walking at the pace of a snail with some subtitles appearing at the bottom of your screen, you get this every single time before a boss fight and there is no way to skip it. One thing I didn't realise though until near the end of the game is that there's actually sound playing through the Wiimote, I just had it muted the entire time. So I can kind of see the charm behind it with someone in the room insulting you from playing the game. You know, I'm really struggling wow, to- Wow, look oh at my this God. big boy! He beat the tutorial! <laughs> About time. I've seen a toddler do better than you. Where did that come from? 
Basically, outside of the insults, all she really has to say is to remind you to save the game and use the items you have while you're there. You'll get some healing supplies as well as a battery to recharge your saber, and then a luchador mask, which in each one of them has a note and it kind of gives a hint at Travis's past while learning you a new grab move. Meaning that Travis was a wrestling fan. Not to be mean though, Travis, you don't really look like the kind of wrestling person, you look like you'd be snapped in half in a matter of 20 seconds in the first round. From what I can see with these new wrestling moves, they don't really add more in the sense of a stats or ability. All it really is is another way to grab and down enemies, meaning you just have to swing the Wiimote and Nunchuck another way to another pattern. Down the line though, one of these actually almost caused you to smash your Wiimote and nunchuck together but hey the extra variety throughout the game is a nice touch and it keeps players on their toes but enough about that once progressing through this door you'll meet the first of 10 bosses in the game he's just sitting there talking about wealth and trying to be spiritual but then asks you to back away but this is where you learn that travis is a bit of a cocky dork and he just kind of keeps pushing him please leave me be you're the one leaving in a body bag i'll only say this once more leave here now huh <laughs> Me leave? You obviously don't know me. You don't get it, do you? And I'll be honest, for as much of a twat Travis can be, I can't help but love him. He makes this perfect blend of a lovable arsehole. So once Travis has spoken about kicking the old man's ass, the first boss battle will actually start. The game will lock you off to a small environment, turning this into a sort of battle arena, where your goal is just to kill the opponent. As first bosses go, eh, he's pretty basic. It's just beat the crap out of him for a while, and eventually he'll release his unique ability, which is creating clothes of himself, who will have separate health bars. And yeah, you can avoid them if you want to go straight for the boss, but having two extra enemies on the screen just makes it harder to fight him but defeat them and then defeat him and the boss fight is over as first bosses go though he, he's fine it's what you'd expect from a first boss in the game i feel like the point of this boss is to focus more on getting the player to get to grips the combat system in this game rather than being a massive challenge which throughout this game you will need to learn especially for the last boss because oh boy that's a doozy. A pre-warning for anybody who goes into this kind of game, the boss fights are the main part of this game. It's a kind of endurance type game. Travis's goal is to become the number one assassin, so after killing Death Metal you'll be the 10th racked assassin, meaning you've got 9 more to go. But it does sound pretty short doesn't it, 9 bosses in a row. Well, yes and no. Once you've beaten Death Metal and chopped his hands off and, you know, given a cheesy one-liner like Travis would do, you'll find out that you're in it to win it now with no sense of getting out. So the plot is set in motion and the game really starts. So once you've beaten each boss, you'll go back to the motel where Travis stays. Firstly, to take a shit to save your game, but after that, you're given a couple of other options to interact with indoors. Some are basic and will be for later, like cosmetics, equipment, or checking collectibles, but the best part of all is playing with the kitty gene. Kitty playtime is very important. You must always look after your pet. Obviously, if you want to continue the story, however, you'll need to leave the motel. In doing so, you'll notice that the exit is blocked off by a limo where you'll encounter Sylvia once more. She'll explain to you that the next assassin is ready to fight you, but before you can get to him, you need to raise 150,000 LB dollars and pay that off to the association. Which at first sounds like a lot, but there's a couple of ways you can earn cash fast in this game. You're told about an agency that will give you some work to earn some cash, but because you're a nobody at first, you kind of just get told to get lost. So, what's the next best thing to do? Get a job. No, no I'm, I'm not trying to be funny, you just have to get a job. You're instructed to go to the job centre and find some work, so once leaving the assassin centre, you're left to your own devices to get to the job centre. And the first thing you might notice about this game is it's actually an open world environment, which, I'll be honest, I didn't really expect coming. You'll have various places to explore throughout the city as you progress through the game, so you can either go to the job centre on foot or do the more sane thing and use the bike. You can call this bike frankly at any point when you're in the open world area and it makes getting from point A to point B much quicker, but I hate using the thing. The driving in this game is stupidly stiff and one slight wrong movement and you'll end up hitting into something. Anytime you do hit something though in this game, Travis will just end up flying off his bike with an arguably long animation waiting for him to get back up again and after a while this gets a bit tiresome, but that's a little part to the rest of the game. So make your way to the job centre and your first job is picking up coconuts. Well everybody has to start somewhere I guess but coconuts, bit of a weird one. Well, I haven't got anything better to do, so I might as well just take this and then head over to the next location. Once you get there, you'll end up doing some sort of mini game, which is collecting coconuts for a couple of minutes. And this is when something came to mind, which I realized about this game. No more heroes? Yeah, it's not the kind of game I expected, but in a good way. These third rate jobs are these little mini games which allow you to earn some money to put towards the next big fight, weapon upgrades, clothing or overall upgrades for Travis. There's a total of 10 of these to do in the game with one unlocking after each time you rank up your character. These start off pretty basic like grabbing coconuts, mowing some grass, filling some cars with petrol, finding some cute cats, to finding and collecting some poisonous scorpions. 
bit weird, but they're all rather fun and I did get a chuckle out of the majority of them. Except the mind detector one though, because that one can literally fuck itself. Each time you beat the minigame for the first time, the contractor will tell you about a more intense line of work he's got for you, and he will leave a ticket at the place you went to previously. These types of jobs are more focused on the main style of gameplay, so instead of a minigame, it's more go kill this person or kill a specified amount of people in a certain time limit. For each time you beat the job the first time, you get two of these first ranked missions, with them obviously giving more money paid out compared to a third ranked job. I won't lie though, I'm actually quite surprised and I rather like how this game went from being just a linear hack and slash game to an open world game with a sense of progression through the ranks while still being a bit of a low life nobody. It's nice to have these little cooldown sections to play a couple of games and do what you want before jumping straight back into the next fight. And while I do rather think this is a fun concept, I do have a couple of issues with the open world aspect. There's definitely some frame rate issues with it dipping at points, especially when zooming down the street on the bike, but there's a more glaring issue that you can see from the gameplay alone. There is nothing going on. Now I'm going to take a stab in the dark and just assume this is due to the Wii's limitations, but the open world just looks really empty. There's nothing really happening, cars feel lifeless and just stop dead if you walk in front of it or an NPC walks in front of them. Actually, take that back for a second, let's talk about the NPCs. Generic is definitely a word I'd use to describe how they look, how they act however is just appalling. You can run them over with the bike, but besides that they have no real interactions with the world. They just walk in a straight line. And hell, you can even push them about, they just don't seem to care, they seem very lifeless. And that's honestly how I feel about the whole environment of this section in the game. Sure, there's stuff you can do, and there's some little collectibles on the side which are important to find, but the lack of anything going on just really put me off exploring. And it wasn't until near the end of the game where I thought, hey, I might as well collect these collectibles to keep seeing them. And let me just address one other thing as well, and it's about Travis. Oh my god, he is so slow. In the main story missions, he's perfectly fine. He'll run about and progress through the levels at an acceptable pace. However, when it comes to the open world, he just jogs at the pace of a snail and there's no sprint button. No, actually, let me correct myself there. There's no sprint button at first. Later on in the game, you'll find a drunk basketball coach who tells you to find some basketballs, or as the game calls it, Lovikov balls. If you find seven of these balls, he'll teach you a technique of sorts to add an ability to Travis like shaking the nunchuck for a leap attack, while another allows you to dash through the open world area. If they had hinted at this thing from the beginning, I would have probably looked into it earlier and not really given much for them. But they don't, and I'm so annoyed with myself because it took me to the end of the game to figure out there was actually a dash button. Any ball that's still located on the map will be marked by a yellow dot on the radar, but due to how the radar works in this game, it doesn't even track your position in real time, and has a couple of seconds delay, as it's working on a more cube based map system. I mean, that's fine, but what I do have a problem is, is with the colour scheme of this radar. With all the buildings being white and grey, you'd think that finding a yellow dot would be easy, right? Well, it isn't for me. I've walked past so many collectibles in this game, as the yellow just kind of blended into the green, so I ended up just kind of ignoring it. But if I only really look near the end of the game, would that mean that this is poorly designed? Or more realistically, was I just having more fun with the main game as I should be? But before we get back into that, there is some other stuff you can do around the city. You've got some free missions that require you to kill everyone in a lot of time slot without being hit at all. Yeah, I'm pretty shit at these. A store to change your cosmetics, and a store to buy and upgrade weapons, and a video store, and then finally there's the gym. In the gym, you can come here to level up Travis. It's only a little minor upgrades, but they're worth doing. To unlock these upgrades though, you'll need to pay a fee, but also perform a little mini game that's uh... Yeah, it's pretty basic, but I guess they get the job done. But if you're doing all this stuff, you'd most likely have earned enough money to pay off your fees from the agency. So head over to the ATM and deposit all the cash you've made, and you'll be able to head back into the motel where you find out where the next fight is. You're told that the fight for rank 9 is based at the stadium, so once you've left the motel, you'll get an option to go and progress to the next rank. For the rest of the game though, it's pretty much the same formula. Go to the location, beat the shit out of the boss, leave, get some new jobs, make money, and then repeat. On paper, this sounds really dull and repetitive, and yeah, it will be at points, but due to how the jobs feel fairly different, I don't mind it too much. And also, when it comes to the bosses as well, they are all in different locations, so it doesn't feel too copy and paste until near the end of the game. When you start each area though, you'll go through just like before, killing everyone in sight within a few levels. However, some of these have different scenarios to go through. There's some basic ones like a different camera angle on a coach, or fighting through a train in the underground, but there's some others that are rather fun and unique. The first one is from the stadium itself, and you basically just play baseball. There's a couple of people in a line that you just have to swing the Wiimote and hope to hit the ball. It's just a fun little gimmick, and it's nice 
nice to change things up a bit. Later on though, there's another one where Travis will go on the same train as he did before, but fall asleep this time. And what will happen is you end up playing a mini game similar to those old arcade space shooters. The final one is when you return to the stadium at the end of the game. You'll enter from the same area from where the boss was fighting previously, but instead of dashing about and killing people, you just go around running them over with your bike. Which is fun at first, but if you fall off, you then have to wait for them to spawn, but it can take forever as you have to go to the specified area of where they spawn because of the render distance issue. Having these variations though actually kept the scenarios feeling slightly fresh. It wasn't overdone which I'm grateful for, but the style of humour this game goes with, like breaking the fourth wall of points, it would have been nice to have a couple more. A majority of these just ended up being go through this corridor and beat some people up. Actually in saying that, at one point it gets so boring that there's actually a lead up to a boss which is just one corridor. You chase someone down this really long dark corridor with a couple of enemies appearing throughout and it's just like 5 minutes of just doing the same thing over and over and it's really boring. But with all that said, I've left my favourite bit for last which kind of negates the entire thing for me. It's the bosses. Each boss has their own little variation how the fight will play out, with an introduction cutscene where the boss and Travis will just chat shit to each other. I love for how such a short introduction to each character they manage to flesh out their personality behind each boss. And that's one of the areas in this game which I really love. I love the different personality behind each boss, they're brilliantly designed and believe me I'd love to go for each boss individually, but we might be here for a while. Well fuck it, we're gonna do all of them. The second boss you encounter in this game is Dr. Peace and he's what I'd like to call a true American. He comes across as a smug arsehole but after Travis attempts to be a cocky piece of shit and piss him off, you'll soon learn that he's packing heat. With draw revolvers he can send you flying across the room. For this boss you just gotta try and get close to him while blocking a bullet and honestly thinking about it he just reminds me of an over the top revolver ostler. Next up is Shinobu, an edgy schoolgirl with a taste for vengeance. She believes that you killed her father, who was Travis's mentor, via some videos? Yeah, I'm a little lost too. But her boss fight was actually slightly harder than I expected. Well, when I say harder, I mean that she has one move that caught me off guard and she beat the shit out of me and then just killed me. And that's the only reason I failed, okay? It's a bullshit move, and I hate it when games do this. Seriously? A girl? You got beaten by a girl? <laughs> Mate, you're a fucking joke. Just give up. Oh my god, Jack, for the love of god, shut the fuck up. Oh, alright, Jesus. Thank you. Not that hard. Doesn't change the fact that you're shit. Well, after Shinobi, you'll head over to somewhere that looks similar to Hollywood, where you'll fight Destroy Man. Man, what a name. Well, when you turn him, this average Joe appears who looks like a mailman and then he just tries being a gentleman the entire time, but you just kind of discover later on that he's just a coward using cheap tricks to beat Travis. Damn it! Whoa! That was close. For a second there, I forgot that you were a killer. You mind if I ask you something? Yeah, what is it, Mr. Cosplay? What? You want to shake hands? We're both fighters, aren't we? Not killers. At least for now. This is a sign of sportsmanship, that we respect each other before and after the fight. Good luck. Likewise. Destroy Spark. <laughs> oh, this is great. Is this guy an idiot or what? Yeah, I'm not going to lie. This boss was a joke. He's so easy. The one thing I immediately thought when fighting him was just, how is he a higher rank than the crazy samurai lady? That's, that's beyond me. Like it wasn't me trying to claim that this game was easy, he's just genuinely made as a piss easy boss. But, oh well, he, he dies rather funny, so I guess that's kind of a good way to negate it. Ah! Don't cry like that. You're a killer, aren't you? <laughs> Help! What? Help! I can't hear you. Help me, please. What is this I hear from a seventh ranked killer? Whatever, it's over anyway. Please, help me. There you go. Thank you. 
After destroying the famous Destroy Man, we'll head over to a minefield beach where you'll meet up with Holly Summers, an army girl with a lot of grenades. She lays traps all over the seafront, which results in you falling into a hole a lot. Like, she'll actually refill the holes and then you fall down them again, it's quite annoying. You'll get a QTE though whenever you fall down one of these holes to either shake the Wiimote or Nunchuck before she throws a grenade at you, and overall it's a basic fight, but weirdly enough this is the only time you'll ever see Travis give a shit about someone dying, and this kind of hints at some kind of plot unravelling, but then it just kind of goes nowhere, so yeah, you just carry on. You do get to watch Travis stream out of a hole though, and that is rather fun. <sighs> Let's see you get out of this predicament. No problem. You'll see. Uh-huh. A bud that will never blossom. A sad truth. Good night, my sweet seventh. Oh, crap! Next up is Let's Shake and oh never mind he's dead. Yeah, that was underwhelming. Right, um yeah, you just have some stranger kill him for you and then the boss fights over, you don't even fight him. I'm assuming going by similar tropes from other games that he's just gonna be a boss later on. But anyway, after winning that, if you can call that a win, we get invited to a show where not only does Travis deliver one of the weirdest lines in this game. Whoa, you're serious? I wouldn't do that if I were you. Oh shit. Oh shit. I'm packing heat, baby. It's also a boss where I struggle to pronounce his name. Harvey Volodarsky? Vol... Vol... Anyway, we'll just call him Harvey. Well, after Harvey kills two girls, he shows off the final act, which is not even five minutes into the show, so how he's still in business is beyond me. But he'll call Travis to the stage, and you'll basically see that he's trying to kill you as part of the show. So throughout the fight, you'll get some little changes happening, and you know what, they're actually quite amusing. He can turn your sabre into a wand, so you deal no damage. He can turn the screen upside down and reverse your controls. Or my favourite one, he will stuff you into a box where you have to escape from. Now I can't tell if this is my copy of the game causing this, but the sound when you hear him trying to escape broke my ears and made me jump out my skin when I had my headset on. I'm going to show you what I mean, and I'm sorry in advance. Now I did edit that slightly to make it quieter, so if you want to know how bad it was, take the audio from that, times it by 10, and you'll have an idea of what I experienced at 8 in the morning. I mean, you could say who needs coffee when you've got that kind of sound in your eardrums for the rest of the day. But overall, Harvey is a really bizarre type of boss, and the next one just gets weirder. The third ranked assassin is just a granny with a trolley. No. Hang on, I've got that wrong. It's a granny with a trolley, and that trolley can somehow withstand the weight of a railgun. Where was she hiding that railgun this entire time? Please someone answer that to me. Right, so instead of a boss fight this time round, you have to make your way up the street while avoiding Granny's gigantic fuck off laser. As a concept for a boss it works, I guess? It's rather dull as the environment is a decaying city with nothing really going on. Similar to the main hub world funnily enough, just with a depressing colour scheme. Granny, or her assassin name, Speedbuster, is quite an amusing concept and again, the cutscenes are what make it great. Imagine if you just went to like Tesco or something and there was a nan there with this kind of thing. I would never want to disrespect my elders ever again. Not saying I do though, before anybody takes that out of context. Now before anybody can, you know, try and tarnish my reputation, let's get closer to the end of the game shall we? So the second ranked assassin is known as Bad Girl, and she's a complete maniac. Her character design and signature weapon reminds me of Harley Quinn, for well, obvious reasons, so look at her. And my only real complaint with her is just like Shinobu, she has a move that can just kill you in one hit. She'll go and sit on the floor to pretend to cry and for the first time fighting her I thought, hey, now's my chance to get this over with. And little did I know she'd pin Travis to the floor and beat him to death. Okay, that's my bad and that's a good way to trick the player. But then it happened again by accident and I couldn't do anything about it and it really pissed me off because she was so close to dying and I had to do it again so it took me three attempts to win. Oh, 
seriously? Shut up! So at this point, you're at the end of the line. With one more rank to go to being the best, this is where the game will start to get a bit more plot heavy. I forgot to mention though earlier, just before buying Bad Girl, you'll get given a note from Sylvia to head back to the stadium, which is where you find Bad Girl obviously, but on the note it says not to find her. Which you'll ignore at first, but once paying out the final note to the UAA, you'll get a cutscene where you find out the entire game was a hoax. Sylvia was just using you to make some money, and when calling the number on the card, you speak to her mother. One thing I've got to ask though, out of all the numbers you'd give someone, why would you give them your mother's? Anyway, she'll tell you to play along with the game for some reason, and tell you the location to fight the final boss. So without questioning it, Travis just goes ahead with it, and then upon leaving the motel, someone will just steal your bike for no reason and place it at the other end of the town. Which means I have to go on foot. Now imagine what I would have been like if I didn't know about that dash ability. So once taking 5 minutes to run towards my bike instead of half an hour, you get to the final build up level where you just have to travel towards the final boss on bike. It's a pretty generic level and I've seen this kind of stuff before but again due to how the bike handles in this game, jumping over obstacles can be an absolute pain in the ass. Again I don't know if it's just my version but whenever I flick up the Wiimote there is a couple of seconds delay for him to jump. So you have to time it just right or you'll end up cocking it up. So once you've done this little bit though, you'll get one more little bit to the build up level which is just some sort of maze where you go through fighting a couple of waves of enemies when all of a sudden you'll reach the end of the level and get one final call from Sylvia where she'll do the right thing and be very sympathetical and apologise. No, she just insults you the entire time. Wow, you actually made it to the end? <laughs> What a legend! True game master over here, ladies and gentlemen. I did not expect you to get this far, but well done for fucking up your review along the way. I've never heard such bullshit, which really compliments the shit show you call gameplay. You didn't even know Sprint was an unlockable move? Right. Thick, uh, I've, had, I've had enough. You can, hey, you can shut up now. Goodbye. Bye, Jack. Bye, bye. Silent. Man, what a fucking pain in the ass. Ah, uh, you always were a cunt. For the final boss introduction, you get some backstory into Travis's past, as the final boss actually claims to be his father. However, at that moment, you'll find out that Travis lost both of his parents when he was little, and that a random girl killed them. And just as you go to question how this person can be his father, he's then killed by none other than the girl who just killed your parents, and her name is Jean. You know, same as the cat. The game will then break the 4-4 by speeding up over the explanation of why Jean did this in the first place, but I'll give you a brief rundown from what I heard anyway. You'll learn that Jean is your half-sister and that you shared the father and he left her mother, causing her to kill herself, and then with nowhere left to go, Jean is then adopted and looked after by her father and abused by him. So once she snapped, she finally kills Travis's parents, and then Travis figures out that Sylvie set the whole thing up to help Travis avenge his parents while also making some money. Yeah, I'm really surprised about how much plot they just threw at your face at the end. The entire game's plot so far has been rather basic, and then in the last two hours of the game, they just amp the story up to max while your guard is down. It's a better plot by all means, but that pacing is just really weird. But after the exposition is over, the final fight will begin. And I'm surprised to say that Jean is surprisingly easy. Like, as easy as Destroy Man. I would have expected the final boss of the game to be in the league above the rest, especially using the generic trope of using all that you've learned throughout the game, but no, she's rather basic and all that really happens is the arena gets smaller the more health you knock off. Well, after a few minutes of that, you beat Jean and then she pierces her hand into your chest somehow when Shinobu will come out of nowhere and chops her hand off. Do it! Right. Brother, please don't kill me. Sorry, Jean. This hurts me too. We're both in the same business after all. And I've... had enough. Time for you to rest, Jean. Good night, Travis. I hope your next dream is a more pleasant one. Right, I get avenging your parents, Travis, but he was an asshole. After finding out what he did, I wouldn't blame her. So once that's over, the game will end. Travis will look really sad for a minute and it will get all really depressing. And then the game will fade to black and that's it. 
Nah, not really. Does what it always does. It goes to the motel and, uh, you know, Travis has a gigantic shit. And during his Grand Duke, another assassin will break the door down and then claim that he wants to get to the rank of number one, so he's going to fight Travis. And then the game would end if you chose the ending option, but I chose the real ending option. So just in the nick of time, the guy who killed Let's Shake earlier in the game chops the assassin in two and then says he'll wait for you outside. Now this is where the true final boss begins and compared to Gene, he's actually hard. It's challenging, his attacks are much stronger and he has a ton of health. And with the amount of damage you have to inflict on him, I hope you're ready to charge that beam a ton. FUCKING CHARGE YOU PRICK! Without any moves that were just complete bullshit and one hits, this is the first boss I actually struggled with. But it was more down to me not learning the attack sequence and dodging him at the right moment because if you can do that, you can swing to his side and then hit him a few and then body slam him into the floor. But the question remains, what do you get from beating him? Well, the final cutscene will let you discover that he is none other than your twin brother. Yep, they actually went down the same route twice. So after learning he's an equal master Travis, they kind of just fight their way down the street into a freeze frame where Sylvia will then admire it with her daughter and then tease that there will never be another game and then a couple of seconds later they tease that there will be another game. As for post game content, you do unlock a new game plus with a new difficulty unlocked as well. I haven't really looked into it but later down the line I would gladly replay this game again. To me, No More Heroes feels like the B-movie equivalent of Devil May Cry. It doesn't take itself too seriously and breaks through the fourth wall at the right moment. But most of all, the combat is really enjoyable. And especially with the bosses being a key point of the game, it just makes this game really fun and great. There's obviously parts I didn't like, and some lead-ups to the boss were pretty identical, but it wasn't enough to really make me hate the game. Except that corridor though, that can fuck off and the open world is very dull and lifeless. But overall, build up towards the next rank has actually been rather fun, and it just made everything worthwhile. You know, it's always surprising with these kind of games, because this should have been something I played years ago when I was younger, but I just never knew about it. And honestly, if you have a Wii and you've never tried this, it's really cheap, so you might as well pick it up and give it a go. As for No More Heroes 2, that'll have to wait till next year, and there is another game coming out in the series, but it's a more spin-off type of game for the Nintendo Switch. So yeah, maybe expect that as well. As for now though, thank you all so much for watching, and also Jack, thanks for coming in and ruining my life yet again. My name is Sir Crackable, and have a good week. Goodbye. Right, now hold on just a second, this video ain't over. Well, it technically is, but I have something exciting for all of you. So recently I was emailed by Marillus, the company that makes the software called Action. It's a program I've been using for years to record PC games. It gives the best quality that you can get so I can provide better content for you guys. Well, they've given me five commercial licenses to give away to five lucky people. If you want to enter this giveaway, head over to the link in the description for the chance to win one of the five licenses. Again, that's five winners for a commercial license to Action. Finally as well if you don't win but would still like to buy the license, use the link below as well and you can use the code SIRCRACKERBULB for a 25% discount. But this only lasts to the end of the year so the choice is yours. This contest will last for only 2 weeks, sign up now if you want the chance to win. And good luck.